Hey guys, Dollman here with another video as promised. This one is about the ship matrix system. Now, if you're not familiar with Star Citizen or searching for ships on their fantastic website, then I highly recommend you check out the ship matrix. The ship matrix is basically where all the ships are stored, and don't worry, you're not going to have to take a blue or a red pill to get there. This is basically a listing of how the stat lines work and why each thing is listed as it is on the ship matrix. This is basically a comprehensive guide on everything about the ship matrix and how you can identify what a ship does for your desired role. Maybe you're looking for the dream cargo hauler um, that you've always wanted, or a combat vessel that's a cut above the rest. Or simply you want a multi-role vessel that fills all the relative roles that you're interested in rather well. So, let's take this step together, people, and uh, jump right into it. So, careers and roles. Now I will list you what each of the careers and roles means. So, combat. Exactly as the name implies, all about shooting and offensive damage to other ships, vehicles, and people on both ends of the legal spectrum. Consisting of military surplus, militia, uh, converted and rare current military stock and the more common ungunned civilian ships there is something for everyone in this group so that's combat combat basically means your standard combat vessels like fighters and bombers and those sort of things transport ships that transport anything as their primary income method be that cargo data or passengers from the smaller ship carrying a single crate to the massive whole E these ships are the backbone of the economy carrying goods in and between systems. So that's where your trade, passenger transport, and data transport ships will be listed under. So remember folks, that's transport. Exploration. For those ships that go on short and long journeys to distant locations, be it for solo, group, or commercial discovery, there is a ship to suit all your explorer's tastes. Equipped with for a variety of missions, types with often with extra transport options included in the larger ships. So things like the Carrick, the Constellation Aquila, uh, the, the Explorer Mustang and one of the 300 series explorers and the 600 series explorer ship. There is plenty of ships to choose from in this category, folks. So if you're looking for something to help you explore distant worlds, exploration is it. That is for the, uh, the, the, the explorer in you, the one who wants to discover a faraway new land and, you know, put your little flag down and say, I discovered that. That's for you guys. So industrial. This is one of my favorites here. If gathering items from the verse is your thing, then industrial is the best group for you, featuring mining, salvage, science, and other similar ships. Anything that gathers a resource from the world contained within this group, whether it's physical matter such as mining and salvage, or intercepting and generating data from the environment. Now, I know this is a bit of a crossover here between the transport and the industrial thing. The transport ships are to transport data, and it's a similar thing generating data from the environment with industrial. So it's a little bit of a crossover there. So, support. Perfect for those who want to be involved in the action, but without shooting everything in sight. Medical, repair, refueling, ships, all part of this group provide a less combat-orientated approach to group gameplay loops. So these are your support vessels, your repair ships and re uh, refuelers. So if you want to go for something that's more along those sort of lines, like um, basically a repair station or a fuel tanker, go for support. If you want to go for a mining ship or a salvage vessel, then you need to go industrial. So, another role here, competition, almost entirely consisting of ships for racing. The group, uh, th those who would like to basically go fast with lightweight, agile ships. Great for racing, but lack the durability for much else. So, this is for your racing ships, for those of you who want to uh, be competitive in that sort of area, definitely look for competition under the... Uh, the thing to look for in terms of the career. So remember folks, a quick recap here. So combat, obviously what it says on the tin with fighters, transport, cargo vessels, and things like this. Exploration, your, it says, you know, exploration ships. Industrial is your salvage and mining vessels. Support is your repair refuelers. And competition is racing ships. But there's a lot more, so let's jump into it. In addition to the six above, there are a few ships 
that we really couldn't condense into one group or another. So we have determined these multi-role ships, as they have such a range of roles, it wouldn't be right to put them in one group or another. Once each ship has been given a career, we drilled down further and assigned it a role inside that group to further define it and what it excels at. So this is basically to give you an idea of what a ship is capable of. If it's a multi-role ship, you can also choose ship career and role chart. So you can choose your career from combat, transport, exploration, industrial support and competition and look for roles. There are many roles such as fighters, interdiction, dropship, bomber, freight, passenger, data, pathfinder, expedition, touring, mining, salvage, science, agriculture, medical, refueling, repair, reporting, and racing. These are the different roles that ships can inherit in this game. There's a whole lot of them. So if you want to find a ship that is designed to your taste, you can use the uh, ship career slash role chart system. Many of the roles can have prefixes such as light, medium, and heavy to better differentiate ships such as the Prospector and Orion from each other as they are very different mining ships. Combat ships also benefit from this as the Gladius, the light fighter, and the Hornet F7C medium fighter would end up being considered as direct competitors otherwise. So you have to understand guys that these ships, not all of them are in the same league as each other. Like the Prospector is a very small starter level mining ship and the Orion is a huge industrial corporation scale mining vessel. So all these new career slash roles are visible in the ASOP terminals in game to help uh, better provide you your choice of ship selection as well as on the website. And in the future, we're aiming to have our own version of a tech tree where you can see natural upgrade routes between all the ships on what you want to do with them. So basically, this is fantastic news. You'll be able to decide to have a look at all the different ships. If you'd like to go into cargo hauling, you can see what is your next natural prog progression, what sort of ship you would like to save up for next in-game. And that's pretty fantastic. So, let's continue here. Spaceship Roll Call. Each ship has a role assigned to it. The case of the multi-role groups, these often have uh, two to reflect their nature. This role is a further clarification of what each ship is designed to do out of the box. The role gives you an overview of what is expected minute to minute, hour to hour gameplay loop will be with each ship rather than day to day loop of a career group defines. Okay. Through in-game customization, these roles can get blurred together. For instance, you can trick out a Gladius hev uh, with heavier weapons, better armor, and more durable components to, extend, uh, to an extent. But it's still a light fighter at its core, and not a medium one. So that makes sense, folks. If you want a medium fighter, best go for medium. If you would like to upgrade your light fighter to be more tanky, then you can do that also. You can upgrade all the ships in the game. While we already see it being very competitive in uh, the right hands against a stock medium fighter, it might be prudent to consider other medium fighter options in many cases. That's basically an idea to uh, help, help you uh, visualize the situation. So it's better to go with a medium fighter than rather than upgrade your light fighter all the way to achieve a medium fighter. You're just better off getting a medium if that's what you're really after. So, um, these are but a small sample of the roles currently available among the variety of star citizen ships and vehicles, and by no means a comprehensive list of all that there is, or all that there will be. Over time, additional roles will be introduced, and existing roles can be expanded upon and detailed further. For the purposes of this post, we wanted to provide you with the... Uh, the brief introduction to some of the gameplay we want star citizen ships and vehicles to offer. Additionally, these roles are starting points for each ship, based on intended on design and a default loadout. Through Star Citizen's item upgrading system and customization, we hope to provide a wide range of options to the player in tailoring the performance and capabilities of each ship, to both improve upon the functionality of its intended role, and in some cases perform adequately outside the boundaries of any conceptions designers may have for the ship. Uh, want a tricked out racing hornet? How about a stealthy buccaneer? Why not every ship is versatile as others? We're excited to one day present you with the tools that will allow you to make each ship truly your own. 
that's pretty cool. So you'll eventually be able to, you know, do what you like with each ship, but only to a certain extent. So don't expect to be able to haul a crap load of cargo on your uh, Hornet anytime soon. Just remember that, folks. Um, so yeah, frequently asked questions. So, what do other roles in exploration mean? Exploration ships are the multi-crew ships for in the exploration category that are able to support extended explorations with much larger supplies and often vehicles. Luxury exploration ships cover both and are uh, in, in both roles, but naturally do them in a much more luxurious manner. On paper, without visuals, if you compare the 300i and the Aurora LX, they'd stack up fairly similar. Uh, one seat, one bed, similar item counts, but in reality the 300i is a much more luxurious ship. That makes sense. Why has my ship changed role from what it was introduced as? We have tried to ensure that all ships remain as close to their originally described roles. However, a few may seem to have changed, but this is more to do with a vague or nebulous original description. Basically, it was uh, not a very wisely put together post on the original post. As development has progressed, a lot of the older ships had very unique roles, which do not fit nicely in with the current game design and need to be subtly pushed in various directions to better fit the intended role. Does my career group restrict what missions I can do? Absolutely not. We do not restrict missions available to the player at all currently and have no immediate plans to do so. It's up to you to decide what is the best ship for the mission based upon the information that is provided. You still be able to take an escort mission in an 890 jump if you so desire, but the difficulty in achieving the same income that would be for a f like a much h uh, higher than it would be for that person if they was to use a different ship like a dedicated long-range combat vessel like the Vanguard or the Banu Defender. Basically, what it's saying here is do not use the wrong tool for the job, or else you're just making it more harder on yourself. That's what I got from that. So that makes sense, obviously. Okay, so let's move on to the next section now. So remember, folks, this was us basically just covering the basics of uh, careers and roles. So let's move on to the next section here. So, ship technical information. Uh, so, ship size. Let's have a look what it says here. The size value is a simplified overview of both the scale of ships physically and the scope of its player investment. While these values are not absolute, i.e. some capital ships may be smaller, some medium ships may be larger, is intended only to be a starting point in your understanding of a particular ship's place in the Star Citizen universe, and not the final word on what it can and cannot do. So, let's have a look here. The little chart of big sizes. What's being a capital ship mean anyway? Vehicle, Ursa Rover, Lynx, Cyclone, PTV. So that's a vehicle, basically a land uh, mobile vehicle that has wheels and things like that. A snub, Archimedes, X1, 85X, and the Dragonfly. Small, Defender, Razor, Saber, Terrapin. Medium, Freelancer, Eclipse, Cutlass, and the Vanguard. Large, Carrick, Reclaimer, Merchantman, and the Constellation. Capital, Orion, Hole E, Endeavor, and the Polaris. So that should give you a general idea. Uh, glossary of ship sizes. Vehicle can only be operated on ground. The range spans from a simple personal transport vehicles like the Greycat through to the exploration rovers like the Lynx and the Ursa to much larger vehicles. Can often be crewed by a single player or a small group. Snub, a ship that is completely dependent on another ship to work over a wide area, sometimes referred to as a para, uh, parasite craft, sorry about that folks, will work in space and atmosphere with generally only a single pilot, often has no quantum drive or fuel intakes, which limits its range without the parent ship. So this is something you'll be able to launch from your ship, like some uh, constellations come with a Merlin attached to the hull. Small. Generally up to 25 meters in length, ships that operate in space with quantum capability, ideal for solo operations but not exclusively single-seaters, appropriate for the vast majority of landing pads on stations throughout the verse. So if you want something that is for you and a friend or just you, this is a uh, good area to look if you're looking for more of a solo adventure in the verse, and you'll be able to land almost anywhere. 
medium. Most commonly, 25 to 50 meters in length can be operated independently, but will flourish most effectively with additional crew. Often contains living accommodations for uh, the crew to support extended missions or some form of cargo area designed to be played with a small group of friends well. So this is a way to, you know, play with friends, have more of a deeper game experience, you know, more about the uh, deep space, uh, you know, not hanging around the space stations too much kind of deal, uh, making longer journeys. Large, frequently found in the 50 to 150 meter length range. These ships can be operated with a skeleton crew, but rarely require, uh, re really require an experienced medium to large crew working together as a unit throughout the mission to achieve their goals. Maintenance and repair costs often become a significant factor in this size bracket. So this is for your big ships like the Carrick, Banu Merchantman, and the Reclaimer, and things like this. You're really going to need to have a decent crew of people with you. Operating it solo is not necessarily the best way to go. If you do want to go solo, at least get some uh, AI crew with you, so you, you don't have the, the major disaster of things breaking down while you're trying to steer your way out of an asteroid belt while under attack by pirates, if you catch my drift. Capital. Huge ships are often, but not exclusively, over 150 meters in length and require significant investment in time or crew to maintain, let alone run. The crew needs to be skilled in many areas to effectively operate these colossal ships and often need a small fleet of supporting ships to help keep them in the best condition or out of harm's way. While these ships are not designed for the casual individual player, they will offer a unique gameplay experience to the dedicated crew who put in the time and resources. So capital ships are the kind of ships that you will not just deploy willy-nilly. These are things that you're going to really need to put some planning behind, get a skilled crew together, and have an objective in mind. It's not for just a joyride or a cruise. These ships are dedicated towards very uh, dedicated roles like the Orion, the Endeavor, the Polaris. These ships are not things you just take out for fun. There are things that these ships are the ones that you really, really want to be careful when using and uh, have a plan in mind, and also have a group of supporting ships, like they said, like refuelers and repair craft, or else you might be in for a bit of trouble. Dimensions. So, these values have all been updated to the current dimensions for the uh, sh ships based on the in-flight position rather than their gears down. So this is, uh, the dimensions are all on ships and how they are in flight, not when they're landed, because some ships may get wider when they land and things like that. So be careful when trying to think will that fit in the hangar because these are all from in flight, not when they're landed. Mass. We discussed ship mass yesterday, so I'll basically read the article in a little bit. Uh, check out the article, how I arrived to this number. But compared with the previous values, they will appear significantly higher than before. Every ship has had a pass and been updated, so while they are all higher, there is now all on the same scale. So basically, things got heavier to make s and it all makes sense. Generally, the dimensions of the ship will factor more into the size classification than the mass. That said, majority of the ships fall into line with this, so small will usually have a lower mass than a medium. But we're leaving room in the future to have ships that have particularly dense or light materials straddle, uh, straddling traditional size conventions. So basically you can have a really small ship that has tons and tons of armor, a lot like the Terrapin, which might be a little bit heavier than a small. It might be a bit like in the weight range of a medium, but it'll still fall under a small because of its size. Cargo capacity. This value is the maximum amount of SCU the ship can safely carry when attached to its cargo grid in the dedicated cargo storage areas, and does not factor in player attempting to fill every corridor, nook, and cranny with goods. As we're discussing cargo and SCU in detail in another article, the one I read earlier, for now we'll say that we calculate this value by using one SEU crates as the minimum size available to be placed and secured in the dedicated cargo grid, if any, of a ship. SCM and FA, uh, AFB. So SCM value is the speed the ship moves in standard combat maneuverability mode, i.e. the default in space movement speed of your ship. In atmosphere, this speed will often be less due to the re increased air resistance and drag. The afterburn. So AFB. 
value is split into two, the first being the standard afterburner top speed and the second in brackets being the supercruise. So uh, this is the max speed when afterburning. This supercruise allows for traveling at much uh, greater velocity than afterburner, but less than quantum travel, perfect for navigating down to planets or moons from the outer markers. You're always in such a hurry, aren't you? Well, that's true, we all have, uh, you know, have places to get to and places to be. <laughs> Don't want to spend it all just trying to get from A to B. That wouldn't necessarily be too much fun. Unless you're an explorer, of course. Um, so yeah, min and max crew. The minimum crew value is what we regard the minimum number of players or hired NPCs to be able to operate the ship in a basic manner while still utilizing its key features, such as a salvage ship being still able to salvage, move, and defend itself, we have calculated this number based on a few guidelines. Number of operator seats in the ship. These are seats controlled specific functions such as f flight, uh, feature critical stations like salvage or mining, or drone control stations which are used to operate other primary features. Number of turrets is uh, divided by two, rounded down. This provides the ship with a limited set defense capability with the minimum crew rather than leaving it entirely undefended. So your minimum crew will basically include everyone at the basic stations and a few of the turrets. This is not like, you know, the max crew. The maximum crew value is the upper limit of, uh, of crew we allow to be supported on board long term, not including passengers. The upper value is generally restricted by the amount of dedicated seats for functions such as flight or turrets alongside the number of beds in the ship where applicable. Just like cargo, these are in safe numbers. You can clown car and aurora if you wish, we've seen it in the videos. <laughs> but uh, the onboard life support systems are finely tuned to only support the maximum crew for extended durations. So expect your resources to be consumed faster than expected. So basically what they're trying to say is, if you only packed three sandwiches, don't go sticking ten guys in your Aurora or else you're going to have a really bad time when everyone gets hungry. Maneuvering stats. In the next article we'll be discussing the changes to how we display thrusters in the matrix with greater depth, but for now the key information for how your ship handles can be found here. These values are roar unmodified speeds, your ship can translate roll in each axis with using boost or afterburn. In such these uh, times are never exact and can be improved by both using the various speed functions of your ship or in the future by component performance tuning. So you'll be able to upgrade your components in, uh, components in the future. So FAQs for this. Why are the SEM and AFB set in certain values and restricted? In reality, there is, a, there is theoretically no set limit for s speed in space, but we restrict this for two reasons, Star Citizen's gameplay and technical. The SCM values are built around where we want each ship to perform from a design perspective and ensure the ship can still do maneuvers as expected and within G-force limits. The higher these SCM speeds are, the harder it is for like a compelling combat to occur, with a majority of players doing little more than shooting at blips instead of having exciting skill-based uh, skill dogfighting where you can see your opponents. This also factors into the afterburn top speed limitation as well. We strive to make each ship feel different and provide reasons um, to either customize your ship or look for a ship alternative while avoiding that best ship at everything uh, that can inhibit multi-faceted uh, game design. Basically, they don't want you to have the god of all ships. Can I still fly my ship solo even though the min crew is listed at more than one? Yes, there will be no um, hard and fast rule excluding the solo operation of all large or capital ships. Some may find themselves at significant disadvantage trying to perform a specific action in a multi-crew ship without a crew. Be that uh, player or AI based uh, you know, people on board. Every ship 
in the game can be flown by a single player, even the javelin. Oh, good God. <laughs> But your effectiveness in most scenarios will be limited to varying degrees. The minimum crew number provided is what we deem as a sensible skeleton crew option that allows the ship to be used effectively in the, uh, you know, effectively as intended while performing the role that it was designed for. For ships not implemented in the game, this is an estimate based on design intentions, as with all game development, these numbers can change after implementation and testing and feedback. Okay, another question here. How does ship size tie into jump point sizing? That's an interesting one. At present, while the focus is building out a single Stanton system, the ship size value has no bearing on the jump point sizing you can find in the star map. While the game systems determining, uh, ter determining which ships can use uh, jump points is still having its design finalized. We can offer that it is not expected that these ship sizes will map one to one with jump point sizes. We are working on multiple methods to determine jump point transversal and update everyone and the ship matrix in the future once the system is finalized and once we are in position to confirm this. So they haven't got really uh, the basics nailed down yet of how jump point sizing is going to work because there will be small to large jump points determining uh, what kind of ships you'll be able to send through them. Like you won't be able to put a javelin through something that only fits in Aurora, put it that way. Can I fit more cargo in my ship uh, that the value suggested? Yes, but do not expect this to be penalty free. We will cover this topic in depth in a further post. But the value is given uh, to the current maximum safe amount of cargo each ship can carry. Any more will be at risk of damaging uh, damage during the flight and other penalties. So basically, if you completely stack out your ship with crates, and you filled all the corridors, don't expect to be able to get to the escape pod in a hurry, <laughs> is uh, my opinion in that matter. And also, when your ship gets rattled and rolled, if things aren't on a dedicated plate, so they're not sealed down, these crates are going to become lethal projectiles leaping around the inside of your ship like a Hadron Collider. So unless you want a uh, one standard cargo unit crate of beans going through your head at uh, 200 meters per second, I would secure it to a special plate. Or, uh, you know, kiss your skull goodbye. Right, so guys, we're going to cover our weapons now, and uh, let's jump right into it. So this is basically the article that details weapons, and we'll get right on it now. They are restricted to a single size item, no more ranges of items such as size 1 to 3. They can only take a weapon directly attached to of that size or gimbaled mount of that size attached to it. Some specific instances may additionally have restrictions to limit them to individual items or types, such as the Vanguard nose weapon array. Basically, weapons will only be able to be mounted on the specific size or port that allows. So, fixed weapon mounts. Attaching a weapon of matching size to the item port directly is what we call a fixed weapon mount and has the inherent benefit of being capable of using the largest weapon made possible by that hard point while contending with limited aiming and requirement to land their shots more accurately. Basically, if you have a fixed weapon, you're going to have to really be uh, accurate, and it's harder to aim your weapons because you have to basically have your ship face the weapons head on. Gimbaled weapon mounts is a different story, however. Gimbaled weapons. As an alternative to attaching the maximum size weapon to your item port, you may choose to use a gimbal mount. Gimbals allow players to attach a smaller size weapon that will enable the user uh, to line their shots up with more ease than a fixed weapon on its own. The gimbaled mount must be the same size as the hardpoint, but can only support a weapon at least one size smaller due to the space it occupies. Basically, if you want to be able to aim your weapons uh, independent of the nose of your ship with a little bit more ease of access so you can track your targets better, you will attach a gimbal and it means you get to use a weapon one size smaller than the mount allows because the gimbal will take up one um, size basically, so it's minus one to whatever uh, the item port allows. These are only the only two types of items that can be attached to weapon hardpoints on gimbaled mounts. Can only contain a single weapon hardpoint, so you can only uh, attach what it allows basically. 
So, other weapon types, or what happened to Twin Link, Tri Link, Quad Link, Barrage, and more? Aside from Twin Linked weapons, many of the items described by various designers over time have not made it uh, the transition from drawing board to implementation. These include things like the Tri Link, Quad Link, Barrage, and others. Most of these had problems at various stages, including this Ising penalty applied to them, which soon became very unwieldy to manage. For Twin Link weapons specifically, these are uh, now as set as turrets, specifically remote ones and will be discussed in that article. There are a fair amount of ships with these sort of items attached, so we encourage you not to worry if you see their weapon count drop down, as they may more than likely now have an extra turret to account for this. The primary dr uh, driving factor in this was physical size. Simply put, by the same time we had two weapons on mount, uh, this was often significantly larger than the base weapon that could go on that mount and caused uh, visual or physical clipping and often resulted in the firing arc having to be limited to such an extent that it became virtually useless. This change from twin link to remote turret has uh, designed to give the player as much functionality from the item as possible. Ships that now have these remote turrets will find that the in the majority of cases, these bespoke items can only be swappable for other custom tailored turrets made for that ship. An example of this can be found on the Mustang, a current chin turret with two size 1 hard points that will be swappable with the new Mustang chin turret containing one S2 hard point. This system will be covered in further detail, uh, on like the article about turrets. So uh, we'll continue with that in a moment. Right now we're talking about weapons. How are ship items displayed? Or you change things and now I can't read any of this. The ship stats update has been a long time coming. In addition to refining our own internal policies and metrics, work was needed in order to display that information to you in as a comprehensive yet understandable manner as possible. To that end, in addition to these changes to the technical information panel discussed in part 3, we have made significant alterations to how default loadouts are presented to the backer. Uh, to the right you will see a legend that guides all items found in the technical overview for the purposes of this section. We'll focus on weapons, but the information here will apply to reading all the items found in the technical overview, which is something you will see on your screen right about now. Things that go boom. To the right of technical overview, we'll find the weapons pane where the various armaments for a ship are found. This section is itself broken down into four subsections, and that's something you can see on your screen right now. So, weapons, uh, the hard points we have been discussing in this article, where you can attach a variety of ballistic and energy based armament. Turrets, covered in more detail in our next part, that's the next part in this video coming up by the way folks, you will find both manned and remote turrets here. Missiles, the things that go in the missile racks used to blow stuff up, torpedoes or missiles can be shown here. Utility items, this is where you will find uh, things like store oil box on the Hornet F7C. While this article is specifically about weapons, we're not ignoring turrets, ordnance, and other hardpoints. We'll be covering each one individually in the next few articles. That's something you'll be seeing in the next few segments of this video. Frequently asked questions or questions we figured you might have. Can I put missiles on weapon hardpoints? No, these are counted as ordnance hardpoints and will have their own posts in the next few days or lucky folks for you, it'll be in the next part of this video, basically. Um, why can I only put a size 2 weapon on the size 3 gimbal? This is primarily due to the game balance. Gimbaled weapons provide a natural advantage due to their independence from the ship's movement when aiming. By reducing the maximum size they can take by one from the item port, their damage output is naturally reduced and should keep fixed weapons competitive in terms of damage per second. Why have you removed the range of sizes on hardpoints? When we looked at it, there was uh, very few ships that actually had this set up. It was primarily the Aurora line, and upon examination, we found it not particularly useful long term, and an easy cause of various inconsistencies. For example, having the range 
from a size 1 to size 2 gave you the option of having fixed size 2, gimbal size 1, or fixed size 1. And nobody ever would pick the fixed size 1 as an option when you could have a gimbal lock to achieve the same result. Removing this option cleans up the design rules and overall setup significantly across the board and does so with virtually no impact on players. So, let's move on to turrets now. So, all turrets. Turrets can only be attached to current hardpoints. They cannot go on weapon or ordnance hardpoints. Turrets themselves have multiple item ports of their own for attaching armament to. These are traditionally weapon hardpoints, but some turrets can also have ordnance and utility hardpoints as well. Turrets can only be swappable out for the same type of turret, and all turrets are hull locked. This means you can only swap a manned constellation turret out for a different variant of manned constellation turret. You cannot swap out one for a manned starfare turret as an example. Remote turrets cannot be swapped for manned turrets and vice versa due to hull requirements. As they are now hull locked, turrets no longer have the size attributed to them. You can only swap out like for like. They no longer have a plus two to the sum size of the weapons calculation. Man turrets. These are turrets controlled by player or NPC acting as a player within them, usually in a seat that moves from within the ship's hull into the turret itself. All man turrets have consistent entrance tube diameter, which means that upon destruction they become a viable breach point. That means if you blow off a turret, it's now become a way into the ship. Remote turrets. These turrets are controlled from a station or seat elsewhere within the ship by a player or NPC acting as a player. Their view is remotely sent back from the turret, allowing them to be con allowing them to control it and see what it sees while physically being elsewhere in the ship. Think of the turrets on like the Millennium Falcon, basically. Remote turrets have no physical path inside for them to players to enter, so they're a great way to use to add defense on on ships where space is a premium, but will often pack a lower size of weapons. Basically, it's uh, it's good because it doesn't become a breaching point when the turret is eventually blown off of the ship, and um, yeah, it's, it's good because you're not losing a gunner at the same time. AI versus NPC versus point defense turrets. A turret can be controlled via an NPC acting as a player, but AI or autonomous control is separate from function uh, requiring a blade to be added to your computer item, formerly avionics module. So, for each turret you wish to be AI controlled, i.e. it engages and tracks independently of uh, player or NPC input, you need to have a blade equipped for that. A blade, think of it like a, a circuit board or a motherboard or something, think of it like that folks. Ships that come with these types of turrets either have these blades already installed or additional computer items to hold them in as a blade space is restricted. This is designed to force players into choosing between adding this feature or other blade features when customizing your ship. Point defense turrets are simply AI controlled turrets um, with the computer and blades necessary and with specific weapon loadout intended to make them effective at neutralizing incoming fast threats like missiles or torpedoes. Any turret can be equipped with these particular weapons and computer blades, PDTs, uh, just come ready to go out of the box, so point defense turrets are basically ready to go out the box. You can turn almost any turret into a uh, point defense turret if you have the right uh, blade or motherboard, basically. The future of turret gameplay, or how we want turret gameplay to feel. We'd like everyone who straps himself into a turret to have a satisfying experience when doing so. To this end, we have been making improvements on the most important aspect of turret gameplay aiming at and hitting your intended targets. Controlling the orientation of turrets has become more responsive and intuitive in Alpha 3.0. And the additional staggering fire mode means that you are able to scatter shots along a line of fire for better total accuracy at the cost of per instance damage. Now, In my opinion, guys, it is very important to switch to a staggered firing mode if you have really big turrets, because it means you're more likely to land those shots, and the bigger the gun, the more impact it'll have, especially when dealing with fighters. Bigger ships, you can just go ham and, you know, fire everything you got. We think being at the controls of such powerful arsenal of weapons should be a visceral experience. Camera shake, G-force effects, articulated directional controls, and an improved UI, in which crew members can identify important targets to each other are being worked on and should come in future 3.0 uh, and beyond patches. 
When this continuing work is completed, having a crew member manning every turret should prove a formidable force. With each turret being capable of firing a salvo after salvo at enemy targets with pinpoint accuracy. Gather a squad of teammates, fill those once empty turret seats, and watch ships like the Retaliator become a flying fortress it was always meant to be. Beware, you pesky Aurora pirates. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not just Auroras that are going to feel it. Hell, even a Cutlass, uh, Cutlass Black is going to have a real problem if uh, you're dealing with something that is literally caked in turrets. So yeah, this is this is good news for those who are traders, salvage crews, and other industrial people out there. Um, you now have a means of defending yourself against pirates. So pirates, beware. Frequently asked questions, or questions we figured you might have. What ships had twin link, or two weapons on a single gimbal, are now converted into remote turrets? Mustang series, the chin turret. Hornet series, uh, the canard and ball turret. F8, the rear turret. 85X, the belly turret, Ursa Rover, the top turret, Reliant, the wing turret, Terrapin, nose turret, Redeemer, Hull Series, nose turret, and the Caterpillar Command Module turret. So these turrets are now, um, we, we were, had them like as a twin link thing, and they are now uh, converted into remote turrets, so that's good news, it clarifies and cleans it up for us, so we now know exactly what's going on. Alright, this one's a bit of a big one, so let's get into it. This is Commodities Units and SCU. This is basically cargo, guys. Um, I will continue on with the rest of the ballistic stuff and all the missile stuff. I'm doing these in uh, order they are displayed. Um, I eventually, we'll get through all of them. This is why I wanted to make this video, so I could condense all this information into one video. So, let's do this. Commodities Units and SCU, oh my. When the player buys a commodity, they will do so in amount of units. Give me 30 units of beans, one might say. Likewise, when buying weapons, equipment, and other things, they will all have a numerical size attribute that governs how many units they take up. These values are essential in figuring out how players store and transport their goods. Which brings us to the unit's bigger brother, the SEU, which is a standard cargo unit, or SEU is a universal measurement for cargo storage and transport measurements. One SEU will be the standard box, the size of which all other boxes are measured. We wanted a universal unit so that we can uh, say a ship has space for 100 SEU. You'll come to know just how many containers you'll be able to fit, more than using more than just using a one. M3, we want to make sure that we can group the commodity within the container in terms of metrics. One SEU comes out at 1.25 meters, which is 1 M3 of cargo space, with 125 millimeter protection on each side, base uh, and lid. When we have our refrigerated containers, biohazard containers, potentially livestock containers in later releases, it allows us to use that 125 millimeter edge for extra protection or bespoke construction without losing the initial cargo space. So, as the name suggests, our cargo is universally sized regardless of what kind of container you come across. One SEU can hold 100 units before it's full. Since one SEU is the smallest sized cargo con uh, storage container, this means buying one SEU or of beans or 100 units of beans um, the same as one SEU of beans. <laughs> That's a lot of beans. Will be delivered into the cargo hold. As you probably imagine, the 101st unit of beans, <laughs> 101st unit of beans, mobile infantry. I know that's not what they meant, but yeah, that's what it sounded like to me. The, <laughs> the uh, 101st unit of beans that is purchased means that the beans are now occupying two SEU in the cargo hold. Basically, what they're trying to say is, if you overfill, say if you go to purchase 101 units of beans, that means you'll basically be filling up two SEU of cargo, even though the other crate only has one, S, uh, one unit of beans in it. So you've got to really balance out your cargo, guys, wisely if um, you want to maximize your space. You cannot mix stuff, however, guys. You can't, say if you were to get um, 50 units of pork and 50 units of beans, you can't mash it all together. Um, inside a single box. Each box has to have its own type of uh, stuff inside it. You So if you were to buy 50 units of beans, 50 units of pork, you would have two SEU of cargo. You can't fuse it into one, 
unfortunately. Unless you're buying pork and beans uh, as a product, then you can, because it'll be still count as a single product if you get Catch My Drift. So we're going to carry on moving here. The numbers game, or my ship's place in all of this. When it comes to uh, deciding on a ship's cargo capacity, we have to think about what role we see that ship occupying within the Star Citizen universe. We have entry-level ships that have been given a limited amount of cargo space. The idea here is that players will be able to buy these ships cheap, and once they're making regular cargo runs with a full hold, should be able to afford going a little bigger. The Auroras and Reliance in these cases are designed to give players the taste of the transporter career without breaking the bank to get involved, and should they uh, like it, they can go bigger. Other ships have cargo capacity without them being considered a cargo ship per SE. So basically, um, these vessels, we simply think players would expect to be able to transport a bit of cargo, though these ships are usually not uh, taking full advantage of the space, but have an area put aside for storage like the Hornet or Mustang. Basically, you'll be able to store a, a couple of boxes of something, like maybe um, you have your personal weapons in there or something like that. Um, then we have the dedicated cargo ships, whose cargo holds are squared off as uh, so they can get as much stuff inside them as possible and able to utilize as much space as possible while still maintaining structural integrity. We're talking about freelancers, starfarers, caterpillars, and the whole series, only to name a few. These ships have their cargo space determined. Um, a bounce of cost and performance. So you got to remember, guys, when you put stuff inside your ship, it will affect your ship's performance. When it comes to determining, determining the where a cargo ship sits in relation to another, we look at its speed, combat proficiency, and make a judgment about what kind of capacity fits with that kind of ship. A classic pairing would be the Freelancer opposite to the Cutlass. The Freelancer has sacrificed some combat and maneuverability um, maneuvering ability to be able to haul more goods. Looking at the new Cutlass, it can hold its own in a fight and even go on the offensive if needed but at the cost of its cargo space. We want players to make a judgment on uh, what kind of ship is right for their specific job, where they will be taking um, goods, how fast they need to get there, how much is needed to uh, fulfill the order. We're endeavoring to make um, certain to know two ships that prov are providing the exact same role. Basically, they want each ship to have a bespoke and unique way of attacking each problem and mission you come across. Even in the specialized field of cargo transportation, there can be even more specialization depending on the routes, danger, even commodities themselves that the player wishes to transport. So, we're doing what we can to ensure that cargo space is also logistically sensible. Cargo squeezed into every nook and cranny of the ship might not seem like a win, uh, might seem like a win for the player on a numerical side, but the act of loading and unloading will become a pain or even impossible um, when you have high, like, you know, with it stacked everywhere, basically, um, with high ceilings and small doorways. The advantage of the Caterpillar with its huge doors will not always be structurally sound for other cargo ships. Um, there may be instances where some ships potentially unusable space left over. So, put it this way. The way I see this is, if you pack a ship out with crates, let's say you have a retaliator, right? You've uh, used your torpedoes and you decide to just pack everything with cargo to try and make some money back. Um, that ship is now going to have some tremendous difficulties, like, you know, flying um, and maneuvering in space. And then when you enter a planet's gravity, if you enter turbulence and all sorts of things, the crates will start to move and jiggle and bounce around. And potentially you could have like a landslide of boxes so you've now blocked your escape route should you need to escape because you now have 6,000 cans of beans blocking your path and you've just been damned to eternity in hell because of Heinz. Now, nobody wants that to happen. <laughs> so, let's continue here. Um, so, packing for the job. Uh, packing for the job you have and for the job you want. Overloading a ship with more cargo is certainly something a lot of pilots have asked for, and it's something we're going to support, because cargo will be able to be lifted and placed by hand. The player won't need a cargo grid underneath them in order to place it, meaning they can release those commodities anywhere. 
We encourage players um, who to want to store their cargo securely though, otherwise a myriad of additional challenges may await you, aka a landslide of beans and a certain doom. <laughs> The more you carry, the more mass you're trying to move around, the more adverse your ship's efficiency is, is going to be. If you're exceeding mass recommendations with loose cargo just placed wherever, you're going to throw out your ship's interior balance and place more strain on a thruster on one side than the other. The flight system will do its best to compensate, but expect to burn through fuel a lot faster and risk additional component wear and tear than optimal. Uh, than at optimized weight. So if you overload your ship, you gotta imagine like overloading an old car, it's gonna basically wear out twice as fast and um, it's just generally not healthy for the uh, vehicle's overall longevity. Additionally, as we develop our physics and internal behavior, we are looking at room temperature, atmospherics, and other forces to act upon the player. And when cargo isn't secure, these systems will act upon that as well. Future updates will see internal forces act upon a ship, so every bump or bang from combat, re-entry, quantum jumps, etc. will knock around anything unsecured in the cargo hold. Dun dun dun! <laughs> Potentially causing it to suffer damage. While the extent of the damage remains to be seen, except some loss of integrity um, and of the goods that you're shipping if not being stored appropriately. Also, keep an eye on any loose cargo if someone opens an airlock too. With nothing keeping it in place, your goods will find themselves at the mercy of any decompression suffered. So if in the event of an emergency and someone is trying to pirate your ship, what you could potentially do is turn off the cargo grid, if you have tons of little crates stacked on top of one another, and force emergency open an airlock, and you can just turn that into a basically a machine gun powered by pork and beans and other various crates of things, and that pirate will get a face full of. It's pretty interesting. So, the true purpose of keeping cargo off grids. Dun dun dun! This is for smugglers and other various criminal activities. Smuggling is one of the next big features we will be adding into the cargo system, as it is something we're excited for players to take advantage of. Goods that are secured in place on the cargo grid will also be considered as declared on the ship's cargo manifest. What this means is that when players go through cus uh, customs checkpoints in the future, or are encountered by law enforcement out on the space lanes, their manifest will broadcast like a trucker handing over the clipboard declaring what's inside their hold that everything is above ob above board. Basically, if you store anything on a cargo grid, it automatically gets declared. Like Think of it like a um, sort of scanning system also. This will allow a player to be able to make a conscious effort not to declare an item as well by de deliberately leaving it off the grid. As highlighted beforehand, a box left in a passageway risks unbalancing the ship, overweighing it and rattling around in the back. But once the smuggling system comes online, players will have a plus side in that it's not broadcast to others as part of the manifest. A player who wants to slip a crate full of contraband through customs will be able to do so simply by leaving it off the grid and avoiding transmitting its details to passing police officers. Of course, the police wouldn't be doing their job properly if they just believed everything a trucker told them. Oh, that's pretty rude. Truck drivers never did anything wrong. <laughs> so they will be scanning ships on occasion to confirm what the uh, transporter is ferrying, whether it is on grid or not. To combat this, we'll be allowing smugglers to add additional technology to their SCU crates, such as scramblers, that will make it harder to detect something. Uh, we're calling spoofers to make a container appear as something else altogether. That's interesting. It's uh, unlikely that any smuggler trickery will be able to stand up to sustained scanning forever, though. So if the player finds them themselves under continued security, um, scanning from the law, or maybe even a pirate looking to relieve them of, the precious, of their precious cargo, unless they have the best gear on the black market to respond with, it may be worth thinking about finding a new line of work. This won't be a life for the meek. Dun dun dun! Frequently asked questions, or questions we figured you might have. The Reclaimer originally was sold with 2,500 standard cargo uh, units, and now it is listed as only 360. Where did the cargo space go? 
As part of the update to the listings, we now refer to a ship's cargo capacity as its usable cargo space for storing and transporting commodities and other items. For the reclaimer, majority of its internal space is dedicated exclusively to storing salvage it has gathered. Since we don't want to misrepresent this ship to potential buyers, we listed the reclaimers having only 360 standard cargo units of cargo capacity. We, uh, our hope is that players looking for the next cargo ship um, have much clearer understanding of the actual usable cargo space. Players ex should expect the same listings on the mining ships like the Orion and Prospector 2. These ships dedicate most of their previously listed SCU space to storing and proce processing metals, crystals, minerals they gather through mining operations, so players will see their cargo capacity number go down compared to what have pre previously been listed. So basically, guys, what they're trying to say is like sh industrial ships like the reclaimer and the mining vessels they have to have machinery inside them to process these things that they're chewing up and they have to have a place to store those uh, things that they've chewed up that stuff that's being stored is not being stored in the same place you can store cargo because that would be kind of messy imagine trying to find your uh, can of beans in the middle of a scrapyard it's damn near impossible it's like a needle in a haystack so it's going to be stored in separate areas from one another to make life a lot easier for us so that's pretty good news so let's continue here with more of the uh, ship matrix details so, ship mass. I'm not heavy, I'm just built this way. Grasping the concept. At the concept stage, ships that are the, that are the trickiest to calculate, as they generally m move uh, through high poly meshes without the benefits of physical sub meshes. This, is, this requires a small amount of work to simplify. Cap hole allows us to accurately generate volume of, for the ship. Capping holes is generally the process of fully enclosing our collision proxy meshes and open faces that can cause issues in engine. In essence, we make them watertight while marking up specific faces that will allow entities to move through them unimpeded. Uh, so yeah, you'll be able to move around the inside. Whilst this is usually done in the production stage, we had to move ahead with this at a simple level for many of our concept ships to achieve standard mass calculations for all ships. My destiny has brought me to you. Uh, once we had a volume of the ship as it is, we solid block of material, um, we then subtract the volume blocked out by the design team for the interior play space. Cockpit, eternal local grid mesh, this new volume, solid minus the interior, is assigned an appropriate density value with a few modifiers. So let's see. Construction methodology. That's a hard word to say. Try saying that three times faster. Origin ships use more advanced lightweight materials that retain strength rather than the traditional st like, you know, old ways like Aegis and Anvil with heavier materials. These materials in play are essential component in accurately accessing the correct mass of a vehicle, ship, or space station. Basically, if uh, you're with Aegis, they're going to build a ship out of old school materials, built tough, old, solid, rusty uh, bolts and buckets and things like that, all weird pieces and glue them all together and then you got a ship. <laughs> but if you're going to go with Origin, expect the metal to basically be sung to and treated and have it stroked regularly and all sorts of very weird things like that. And I know if you're an engineer hearing me right now, you're like, what the hell is this guy talking about? But I'm trying to break it down in a very, well, less boring, you could say, way. <laughs> Alright, so species construction. That's also very important. Zion ships are renowned for the material and are significantly lighter than human counterparts. With their collaboration with MISC, allowing some crossover design, we'll work with the lore team to determine not only the aesthetics in play for a specific species like the Banu or Vandul, but the type of resources at their disposal and technology advantage of their culture to determine the materials used in construction. So expect a Vandul ship to be made of knives and sporks and forks and all sorts of other crazy things glued together and welded up. <laughs> and uh, expect the Banu ships to be built for maximum profit. So, design role. Ships that are naturally heavily armored or require more rigid internal support to generate a uh, denser value, it is 
vitally important not only to consider the source and history inherent in each ship, but its intended purpose within both the lore of the Star System universe and the design of our game. So expect a Reclaimer to be incredibly heavy, incredibly bulky, very, very, very sturdy, as well as a MISC ship will be more towards the other end of the spectrum, so it's built to be more uh, built so it doesn't burn too much fuel necessarily in doing all of its actions, so more economy, uh, built more economically, basically. It's what's inside that counts. Once the mass for the external chassis of the ship was generated, we used the internal volume again to generate a weight for the interior. This simulated all the inter interior paneling, doors, wiring, etc. as the design blockout volumes and local grids are slightly larger than the interior playable space as they encompass the walls, floor, meshes. We um, felt that this was better reflection on the overall mess. So you gotta remember folks, there is a lot more than just, you know, like the little corridors. There's also ceilings and floors and walls and all these other things and um, there's all these parts of the internals where you gotta think the modules would go and coolers and all these sort of things. It all comes together to uh, help calculate the ship's mess. Only what you take with you. Finally, we looked at the ship's purpose of current default loadout and added the specifications for each of these components, which also got a rework pass to the final mass generated from the ships above. And you'll see a little example here on your screen of mass calculations. What does this mean? All of our ships and characters now behave much better as the values used throughout the game are much more in sync. One example we uncovered during this rework um, was that the variety of ships, uh, the physics message, uh, meshes were uncapped during the attachment and having the mass assigned to them was causing the engine to incorrectly calculate the mass of the detached part and thus it would behave poorly. With all the parts now capped or in the process of being capped, ship destruction and part detachment is much more reliable and believable. With less instances of a huge ship debris part spinning off at excess speed, in addition to better behavior, it also meant a lot of um, systemic features can be better accounted for, such as carried items and cargo. Previously, with ships being so wildly um, different in weight, the simple act of adding a heavier weapon could significantly alter one ship's um, a ship basically unintentionally. So the idea is everything eventually in the game that you put on a ship, including you and your heavy armor, will be added to the ship's total weight. The cargo, the things you carry, your uh, little bobbleheads, everything is going to be calculated towards the weight and things like that. So um, racing ships, do not bring along any trinkets and try to fly in your underpants if at all possible to reduce weight. Frequently asked questions, or questions we figured you might have. Will changing the item mass on my ship, intentionally or through damage, actually have an impact on its flight? Yes, it will, though not immediately in Alpha 3.0. When we do the initial tuning value, we base it around the default loadout and structure, then give the ship goal times to achieve the desired results in 0G and atmospheric flights. Generally, the ships are able to achieve these goals, as they are not absolute timings. Outside of any external forces, adding mass will change the flight characteristics should you make the center of mass uneven, may not do so for the better. We anticipate this feature is coming online in the future in Alpha 3X, so that's alpha after Alpha 3.0. Um, so what other aspects of mass have changed outside of ships? Every single piece of armor, every item you carry on your person, has an applicable mass. And these are all directly tied into the actor status system. The heavier you are, the more exertion there is uh, to perform actions, and these consume oxygen quicker, or even may limit what actions you can do. This system also extends to items carried on ships, carrying a small crate of heavy metal, will I'll slow you down more than carrying a helmet in your hands, and these all get added onto the mass of your ship, 
when you are inside of it. So if you decide to carry a box of extremely heavy materials and you're wearing your heaviest armor and you've, let's say, been eating all the pies, it's gonna calculate towards your ship's weight. Um, and, you know, it'll all get added together. That's pretty cool. So yeah, let's let's continue here. We're now beyond the halfway point, folks, so don't worry. Uh, we're almost through this. We just have thrusters, ordnance hardpoints, other hardpoints, and variants of modules, and then we're done in this complete comprehensive guide. So let's keep on trucking. So let's move on to thrusters now and uh, see what it says here. The second change to notice is the removal of size attributes for the thrusters. These have been removed for such the same reason as TR was removed, as thrusters are unique to the ship and swappable in complete sets and loses all meaning. Instead of the old thrust rating and size values, we now display the amount and information on the types of thruster equipped to your ship between the two categories of thruster. Main thrusters! So anything with a M on it is a main. The primary thrusters on a ship that are responsible for making it go forwards. These are the most important ones on traditionally constructed ships and provide the bulk of forward momentum. Think of the engines on the back of the Javelin. Retro! So these are your braking thrusters, basically, guys. Having removed from the, uh, having moved from the maneuverability section of the old Matrix, these are now counted towards the main thruster category as they are critical thrusters set on the ship. There is little point having the biggest thruster around if you can't stop in time. Generally found in pairs, the ship may have more or less depending on the rolls and having a damage on one can cause serious issues when trying to stop so if you uh, shoot the hell out of these, um, say you spray a lot of fire at the front of a whole E and you manage to take out all of its retro thrusters, you've just created a runaway train. It's not going to be able to stop. <laughs> really interesting gameplay uh, dynamic. Imagine trying to repair those on a, uh, a whole E as it hurdles towards a planet. You have to try and get the retro thrusters working uh, to slow you down before you enter the gravity well and then you're doomed. That'll be great fun. VTOL, so anything that has a V in it. These thrusters provide lift in the Z axis and are either uh, fixed in one position to provide continuous upward thrust or can pivot when needed to provide that thrust. Basically, think of the engines on the Idris and the. Um the Idris and the Reclaimer, those are the ones. Cargo or particularly ships, uh, cargo or particularly ships that tend to have fixed VTOL thrusters on the underside if they are required to enter or exit planets or moons with gravity to aid them leaving the atmosphere and will also slow their descent. If a ship does not have any dedicated VTOL thrusters, it is not the end of the world. It just requires uh, more forethought under those circumstances mentioned before. Basically, you're gonna crash. <laughs> maneuvering thrusters, so fixed means F. Fixed maneuvering thrusters provide instant thrust output as they do not need to align to the desired vector first. This gives a quicker response, leading to more agility. The downside is you need to have more of them. The minimum of 12 on the ship to provide the ability to move in any direction with, um, you know, six degrees of movement. Gimbal. So this is with a G, folks. Uh, if you see something with a G, it means it's a gimbal thruster. And these are my favorites. Gimbal maneuvering thrusters provide thrust on one or more axes as they pivot or rotate to align themselves with the desired vector providing thrust. This allows less thrusters to be installed, but at the cost of slow response rate and small amount of power required to move them into position, making them vulnerable to power management problems. Basically, these, yeah, I like these thrusters. They're pretty cool, the uh, gimbaled ones. I don't know, I just find them more satisfying to watch, to be honest. The best way to theorycraft ship performance using these stats is to consider the types of thrusters in conjunction with maneuvering stats on the technical information panel that we detailed in the last post. Basically, what they're trying to say is, the heavier your ship is, the more thrusters you're going to need, and if you have gimbaled thrusters, your ship is going to have a delayed response time before those thrusters really kick in, and the heavier that ship is, that the more that could really affect you. So if you're needing to make a sharp turn, fixed thrusters are really the way to go. Frequently asked questions, or questions we figured you might have. 
If thrust ratings, TR, are not displayed, will they ever come back? In some form, yes. Whilst we've removed them from the ship matrix for now, due to the above reasons, we have plans to bring them back and a more useful form of, uh, of them with ongoing thruster and flight module updates in future patches. In part, uh, with somewhat overpowering maneuverability thrusters that have become commonplace with the changes to flight module in 2.6. If you will remember, ships got a lot slower in, as of 2.6. We can swap out thrusters from ones with increased performance to other abilities. That is a goal, but not possible in Star Citizen Alpha 3.0. We will be including in a future update, we plan to allow players to swap out their thrusters in sets, main and maneuvering together, for ones of alternate type, such as racing or stealth styled ones. These would come with a visual difference to differentiate them from stock loadout alongside adjusted stats in various systems to provide a different flight experience from the normal ones. For example, swapping out a Hornet's default thruster for a set of stealth thrusters would seriously reduce its IR emissions over standard at the expense of performance and wear rate. So expect them to be a little bit more fragile and to burn out twice as fast, but at least you won't show up on radar, which is pretty handy. So we're now at the ordnance part of the ship matrix. Hopefully you haven't fallen asleep and you're still very much awake. <laughs> Alright, let's continue. Missiles. Missiles have tremendous maneuverability in flight and excellent tracking of fast-moving targets, but with limited payload spread compared to torpedoes. They will likely retarget more reliably on missiles or correct from countermeasures more effectively due to the advanced and efficiently placed maneuvering jets. Maneuvering performance may be negatively impacted when being used in atmospheres due to atmospheric effects. Now. I just want to say quickly, this is one of the little gripes I have with missiles, because uh, currently today, with today's technology, missiles are very effective in atmosphere, and I don't get where we kind of lose that in uh, hundreds of years' time. But oh well, it, it makes sense, it's balancing. I'm just going to go with that. <laughs> Torpedoes! Torpedoes pack a much larger punch than missiles, fully appropriate for their weight class. While generally slower and less agile, these are recommended for use against larger or less mobile targets, such as capital ships. They are also more resilient to atmospheric effects due to their inherently lower base maneuverability. So basically, they handle terribly, so in atmosphere, they're still going to handle terribly, so there's not that much of a difference in uh, their maneuverability. So, let's continue here. Missile racks. Missile racks are attached uh, first to ordnance hardpoints, with missiles or torpedoes attaching to them. Not unlike a gimbaled mount, these missile racks have sizes similar to weapons. And there are multiple missile rack options per hardpoint size with adjustments to payload. Put simply, the size of the rack equals one missile of the hardpoint size being attached. Heh, <laughs> racks. <laughs> God damn it. Alright, let's continue. To get two missiles attached to that rack, drop the missile down one size. To get four missiles attached to the rack, drop the missile sizes down. They must drop two sizes. The legendary octo racks mean you can drop the missile sizes down by three. This also means the rack itself must be at least size four. So if you have a size four rack, you can have four size three missiles. That's pretty fantastic. No, I mean size one missiles. Sorry about that, folks. Four size one missiles. God, thinking about racks. <laughs> Some ships have individually bespoke, bespoke racks. The Constellation, the Starfire Gemini, the Freelancer Mist, that are modded, molded directly into their hull. These cannot be exchanged for others. The only customization possible in these cases is the swapping of missiles themselves. To calculate contents of the missile rack based off the size, let's look at the Burring Mars and series. So the Boeing MSD-414 Marsden Missile Rack, rack size 4, num uh, number of missiles 1, missile size 4. So basically, if you had a missile rack sized 4, um, you could get 2 missiles on there of size 3, you could get, you know, 4 missiles on there of size 2, and you can get 8 missiles of size 1. That's pretty fantastic. Rocket Pods. 
development continues. We intend to allow players to attach other items to these hardpoints, the first of which are rocket pods that fire unguided missiles similar to ones already found on the Mustang Delta. Rockets will be available with a variety of fuse types, like timed impact and proximity. Rockets should be perfect for attacking uh, ground targets where you want to saturate an area with explosives. It's the only way to be sure. Rockets and rocket pods will have sizes and metrics similar to missiles and missile racks in an effort to ensure they can be swapped out without causing clipping issues. Uh, ships that have bespoke pods that are molded into the hull, basically Mustang Delta, or have initial bomb bays, basically the Sabre, are locked to their original stock items. The only customization that can be done in these instances is by swapping out the missiles, rockets, and torpedoes themselves. Going forward, we hope to expand on the types of attached uh, items attached to these ordnance hardpoints in our efforts to provide additional gameplay opportunities. Some of our current considerations are distortion field generators, smaller versions of what gives you something like the Avenger Warlock its punch, fuel pods to provide extra hydrogen or quantum fuel supplies for longer range flights, and mines, this one's my favorite, dropping explosives that safeguard an area, space, land, or sea. Hmm, mines. <laughs> Frequently asked questions. Do dumbfire missiles still exist in the game? As of 2.6.3, they have been removed from the, from the game. Any previous sold or described dumbfire missiles have been given an abbreviated lock time and a limited amount of self-guidance on a target. This was done for two reasons. As dumbfire missile isn't really a missile, it's more of a rocket or bomb. And secondly, as we introduce widespread rocket pods, dumbfire missiles will simply muddy the waters. So they are gone forever. Now, on to other ship items. Utility hardpoints can only take utility items, no swapping them out for weapons or missiles. So let's continue here. Utility items have a numerical size system that allows them to be swapped out and mixed between ships. Like other hardpoints, some items usable here are bespoke to the ship and would therefore be non-swappable. For some ships the, with utility hardpoints, you can swap out the utility items to change their functionality. When you can swap utility items out, it may not always be as effective as simply using a dedicated ship designed for that cause. You could swap the Terrapin's radar dish out for a mining laser or a tractor beam to allow basic mining or salvage, but you would have no uh, discrete way of processing it. In a situation like this, you would likely need a second ship nearby for processing of things effectively. Allowing a certain level of interchangeability for ships, um, or, well, interchangeability for groups of players to cobble together unique gameplay out of unexpected elements is something we look forward to. The idea that you'll show us what truly is possible in Star Citizen. I'm still waiting to see the... Uh, Caterpillar covered in tractor beams. That'll be pretty interesting. And uh, dragging small asteroid fields behind it. <laughs> an interesting example here might be a small fleet of ships, including an Orion, where the Orion is great for mining, but is slow and ponderous to realign. Considering that its tractor beam turrets that help guide rocks into its mining mechanism can still only do so much. In this situation, players with similar ships equipping tractor beams would be able to help ferry more material either directly into the Orion or within reach of the Orion's beams to create a more effective or efficient operation. The remaining ship and vehicle items displayed on the ship matrix consist of the following items. Power plants, coolers, shields, generators, fuel intakes, radars, quantum drives, jump drives, computers, formerly avionics, motherboards or modules, and fuel tanks. Aside from fuel tanks, all of the items are swappable and uh, are there to ensure balance. Fall under one of the five size categories. Vehicle, small, medium, large, capital. Each uh, item port is restricted to a single type and size, meaning you cannot put a power plant on a hard point that a cooler occupies, nor can you swap out two small shield generators out for a medium shield generator. 
the jump drive in output between each item uh, type varies, but it can roughly be considered to be a 3 to 1 ratio, as in 3 small items give you roughly the same output as 1 medium. So that makes sense. If you have, say, 3 small shield generators, it's the equivalent of having 1 medium. So that's pretty good. Item grades. Every swappable item in the game is assigned a grade for ease of comparison. This should be your first port of call when deciding what items to buy and swap out, as it gives you a simple scale to compare against. Additional details about the individual nature of items will be viable, uh, visible to purchase screen of any vendor. But for a place to start, we provide the simple letter grade. So, different grades have different values to the items. A. So, A grade. The best possible performance usually has additional sub-item slot. B, a good grade to perf uh, like to performance, may have an additional sub-item slot. C, standard grade for most items. Ship B, um, will be under this grade for you know their default stuff and average performance. D grade, lower grade, generally makes up the NPC AI populace, good for an emergency used to get um, through troubles. So this is, if your uh, main thing blows out, it's good to have a D grade something handy so you can quickly swap it out. Okay, let's continue. Most ships come with a standard um, with a default C grade components. Some more exotic or specialized ships may come with B grade equipment in default loadouts which can be often seen reflected in their price. Of course, the reverse can also hold true, where cheaper ships may come with D-grade components by default. They'll still work fine and get you where you want to go, but you'll want to consider upgrading them after a while, so they're going to basically start to break down and become more of a problem. Think the Millennium Falcon when it's really run down and stuff. Item classifications. In future 3X patch, we plan to assign every ship and every item a component class. This means players will only be able to put an item of that class into a ship that can utilize it. Military, the best overall at um, of items, basically functionality and the expense of emissions and cost. So military is pretty damn good. Civilian, the most common wide range of behaviors to suit costs. Options to approximate all other categories but not as specific. Stealth, vastly reduced signatures, consumption at the expense of functionality. Industrial, reliably high output and lower wear, high emissions. So they'll see you coming a mile away. Competition, higher performing than military, but at the expense of durability and stealth performance over everything. So for the best possible performance, but over a short period of time. Racing ships won't last forever, folks. You're going to need to swap out pieces on them quite regularly. So I'm guessing that's where the uh, cost of racing is really going to mount up is in the components cost. So you want to win as many races as possible, or at least finish in the top five is my guess. At present, no ship is restricted to a single class of item, which each having at least two classes and virtually all of them featuring civilian as an option. While this system is still in development, the idea is at its core to prevent players from making certain ships too powerful within respective areas. We still want there to be an enormous amount of customization available, but the system we're still developing would do things like limit the chances of finding a military spec 85X or a stealth herald simply due to people buying the best items of that type. Sub items. Sub items live inside components and provide a boost to the base effectiveness in a variety of ways. Currently, they are consumable parts that will wear out much quicker uh, than their host items themselves. Without sub-items, the base item still functions as normal, but will find a small boost in performance with sub-items. Sub-items, well, like when they're installed. Basically, you want to carry spare bits along with you um, to keep everything functioning at maximum capability. Each sub-item fits into one of three categories, each boosting a different set of stats for that item. Efficiency improves overall effectiveness of the main item by reducing power or improving cooling performance. Now, this is something you may want also in your, uh, your trade ship and things like that. Protection reduces the damage being dealt to the main item by absorbing different damage types or reducing wear rate 
and misfire chances. Now, misfires, that's pretty interesting. Detection. Inhibits emissions in various spectrums from the main item or provides resistance to scanning. So this is good for you smugglers out there or stealth ships. Sub items can fit in many different items that are not restricted to a specific type of items such as power plant sub items. Frequently asked questions or questions we figured you might have. Are computer blades sub items? No, they are their own standalone item that adds or expands functionality rather than improving a baseline stat. While currently uh, they can only be added to a computer, items that may uh, may not be the only place for them in the future. So you may be able to put your blades in other places. I'm worried about the restrictions of classes on ship and items. Will it mean my ship gets nerfed? We're still in the design phase of this system and therefore still working on all the edge cases we have intentionally. For 3.0, uh, the default loadouts for the ships actually are the correct grades, classes slash classes, that they are planned to be, so the performance of those ships should change and there will be main, many, well, there will be mainly uh, upgrade paths even with the class restriction. We'll provide more information on the class restriction system when we have a more concrete information to share. Are there other items that I can swap out for my ship? Absolutely. The list here is just the uh, items that are on the ship matrix. And we have many more uh, in planning or in game, such as scanners, batteries, and armor. So there's a lot more stuff to come, folks. Don't worry. Um, so basically, to rough this all out, you'll be able to get better items for your ships to help them perform their tasks, like better base items. Um, and some may come with sub-item slots, and those sub-items will wear out twice as fast, but they're basically to help boost the effectiveness of the main item. If that sub-item does eventually wear out, don't worry, the main item won't die, but um, it won't be getting that little bit of a boost anymore. So it's not the end of the world. So let's continue here, folks. Right, folks, this is the last part of the ship matrix now. Uh, let's get on with it. This is the variants and modules. Uh, what is a variant? A variant is a ship that has a modified hull from its parent ship with either a physical geometry difference and or hardpoint changes. The key part of this is the hardpoint changes between variants. For example, the Origin 300 series are variants as not only are there geometry changes, but also hardpoint changes in terms of weapon amounts, sizes, and thruster quantities. When talking about geometry changes, simply changing the skin or paint does not constitute a physical change. And this will be talked about further below. So I'm going to continue here. What is a module and is it a variant? A module is an item attached to a ship, generally containing an entire room that can be swapped in and out. The module item itself can contain additional or alternative hardpoints. A ship that contains a module that can be swapped out does not by itself merit being called a variant unless it mean, uh, meets the criteria of the variant as defined above. Even if the module contains hardpoints that are changed between them does not count towards the main uh, ship's variant criteria. A good example of this is the Aegis Retaliator, which has two modular rooms um, and has been previously available as both a bomber and a base option. The base option simply has nothing equipped to those module hardpoints and can be flown as is, although naturally has no functionality beyond being flyable and having five turrets. The bomber version comes pre-equipped with two torpedo bays um, modules which give it the ability to store and launch up to six size 9 torpedoes. What about the other things like the BUKs or loadout changes? Now if you remember guys, BUKs are from back in the day and I'll get into more detail about this. One of the more confusing and often queried systems was the Battlefield Upgrade Kit. That's a BUK. That was announced alongside the Vanguard and its variants. The BUK systems was theoretically designed to make it easy to swap between the three versions, but for a variety of reasons wasn't clearly explained and understood, and as such we've simplified it. For each BUK owned, this will be converted into a combo pack of the relevant module to fit the, int uh, the center room. And the relevant items, nose, turret, etc. to go with that system. No more BUKs will be offered going forwards, only, only these combo packs. 
So, the Vanguard Sentinel and Harbringer are variants of the Vanguard Warden as they uh, contain exterior geometry differences alongside different hardpoints. The Vanguard Hoplite is a variant of the Vanguard Warden and does not have a modular hardpoint. Like inside, to take everything, uh, to take any of the other three items, it can still mount the nosed and turret items from other vanguards. However, you can't swap out the back, basically, where the troops are stored. Is what they're trying to say. To give us some examples of what is possible within these changes, you can take your vanguard warden, remove the center room slash module, and provide you have the sentinel and harboring a combo packs uh, can be applicable. To attach to these Harbringer's center room module and the Sentinel's nose and turret items. Externally, this would still look like a Warden, as the geometry and skin remains as the Warden, basically. With the Ordnance hardpoint sizes and quantities, but packing the rocket pod turret of the Sentinel and internally would have the torpedo launcher of the Harbringer. Another area of confusion was the Masters of Flight series we announced with the launch of 2.6. These were offered as variants, but due to the above definition, no longer fall into that case. With the exception of the F7C Wildfire, which as it is, uh, as it has hardpoint changes, is a variant. Any package offered where it is purely item changes and skin or paint changes are now referred to as special editions. To summarize, physical geometry difference and or hardpoint changes equals variant. Complete, completely ch uh, interchangeable sections equals module and visual difference item alternatives equals special edition. Uh, with this, we bring our 10 part shipyard series on the new ship matrix to a close. We hope you found this series of articles and informative updates on the current state of Star Citizen's overall ship design. As with all other aspects of Star Citizen's development, work will continue from this point onwards. Existing IDA systems will continue to elaborate new systems as they come online, and future updates to the information shared here may be made through our variety of communication channels. Be they segments on Around the Verse, posts on Spectrum, or simply even additional shipyard follow-ups, Star Citizen will continue to develop and as it has done in the past, we'll do so with your feedback. In the Shipyard subforum section on Spectrum, you will find a 10 uh, different threads on each of the subjects from the series. We encourage you to post your questions, share your concerns, and explore the possibilities this, of this new information and the new game systems we bring to mind. Also, we'll do our best to follow up with the answers there and use thoughts shared to inform our decisions going forward. We hope you are as excited about the verse we're building as we are. We'll see you in it. Frequently asked questions, and there's only one here. Are these changes final and will my ship always be a variant slash special edition? The majority of these changes to variant slash special editions will not be going live with 3.0 as we are working on the finer details on them as ships such as the Mustang and Slash 300 series are undergoing reworks and may change during their production. So that pretty much wraps that up. So gentlemen and uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's pretty much it folks for the variance matrix, uh, the ship matrix system. I hope you found this video very informative. Um, I've covered every base here that they've offered available. Um, that's careers roles, ship technical information, sh uh, weapon hardpoints, turrets, SU cargo, ship mass thrusters, ordnance hardpoints, other hardpoints, variants and modules, and that's the lot. I want to do this in one video. Um, there are plenty of other YouTubers out there who have done this all in little segments, uh, one after the other, but personally I have hard time trying to follow lots of little videos and trying to figure out what order they're supposed to go in. So I decided why not make a video that has all of them condensed into one. So you can just hit play on this and listen to it if you want to in an audio form while you're doing something else, maybe while you're on a run or you're going to work and you don't have to try and cycle through many different videos and uh, hope you get the right one after the other and deal with all those annoying advertisements. This is just pure Star Citizen all the way. As you know, my channel is completely non-profit. I do this all for free for you guys. I have no advertisements on my channel. 
and I do work very hard, let me tell you that. <laughs> um, I am not a professional video editor or anything like that. I am doing this as a hobby, this is all part of my spare time, and I'm doing it because I really do thoroughly love the Star Citizen community. You guys are amazing, you've brought me nothing but joy, and I'm trying to return the favor. So, expect many more Star Citizen videos on this channel, I've already made well over a hundred without a single advertisement or payment. And I am proud of that, able to do this all for free. So guys, um, expect to see my beginner's guide coming up soon, uh, how to make a Star Citizen account, all that stuff, yada yada yada. And I'm going to be doing detailed videos on every single ship in the game with these new stat lines. And I mean every single detail on them. So expect to see that. I'll be doing it in alphabetical order by manufacturer from first to last. And should any new ships come online in the meantime, I will also add those to the list. So, thank you guys so much for uh, subscribing to the channel. It does make all the difference to me. Um, it really uh, helps spur me on to continue doing this. Leaving those little likes and subscribing does go a long way. Um, it helps with the moral uh, moral side of it for me the um, what's the word I'm looking for here the morale there you go uh, to continue going please leave your comments in the comments below if you see any mistakes or anything like that please notify me and I will try to improve my videos by doing so and um, yeah if there's something I missed please let me know if you enjoyed this video please let me know in the comments below if you'd like to see more stuff like this as you know let me in the com let me know in the comments below so, you know the drill, Commanders. Fly safe, and I'll see you in the verse. Oh, and one last thing. Remember to fasten those, like, uh, SCU cargo units of beans down pretty tight. No one wants a can of beans going through the back of their head at 200 meters per second. Alright, take it easy, everyone. Fly safe.